Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Psalm 119, 1 through 8. You see the distinction Aleph there. That's because Psalm 119 is an acrostic. The first line of every, first letter of every line is the Aleph in Psalm 119. This is now the word of God. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes do not forsake me utterly. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because you are a God, and we praise you because you are worthy of it. We are so thankful, God, for your goodness and grace, and even the songs that we've sung tonight that speak of the great sacrifice and payment of Jesus, that he paid it all. And even as this last song we've sung, and we think about the impossibility of our own obedience, the impossibility of us having the strength to keep your commands, and yet we know when we come before you, we have Christ, and we're able to sing hallelujah. We praise you for that. Father, tonight as we study your word, I pray that your spirit would make it clear, that you would help us to understand exactly what was said and exactly what is meant, that we may glorify and honor you and have our lives challenged and conformed into the very image of Jesus. And we ask this, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight it could be for some, I'm counting on it, I guess, that it is a little bit familiar territory um, if I look at my notes, it was 10 years ago when we actually went through a study of Psalm 119. Taking each stanza on a Sunday night, we studied through this psalm. And so I know if you were here, you all have a perfect memory of everything we studied at that time. So there's no need to rehash all of that. That's probably not the case, but I do know that all of those sermons and all of those notes are available on the website. And so the second we start Psalm 119, Karen is going to get on the website and listen to every one of them. And so in order to do this again would just be redundant. I have no interest in re-preaching the same old notes. Um, we're going to look at it a little bit differently. Typically when we study a psalm, um, you've noticed, we try to cover a whole psalm in a sermon. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because uh, I like to make sure we get the point of the whole thing. Uh, when the psalmist sat down and penned that psalm, when the Holy Spirit inspired it, each psalm had its main point and its main theme. And it's always important to me, if we can in one sermon, to cover that so that we get that main gist of the psalm. That being said, in any given psalm, one, and if you read Charles Spurgeon, he does, one could take one line of most psalms and preach an entire sermon just on one statement that's made in some of these psalms. And so the point being... We cover these psalms in sort of an expositional manner to cover the gist and the heart of the psalm, but there's always more that could be said. So since we're going to go through Psalm 119 again, we're going to look at it a little differently. I probably plan to at least sort of highlight again what we learned the first time we went through it, but probably more so to maybe pick a line or two out of each one of these stanzas that seems to make a point that we can, we can uh, talk a little more about. So maybe we'll put it this way. The first time we went through it, we looked at the forest. This time we may pick out a few trees and examine them and hope to get them and, and understand a little bit better some truths that God would have for us. So tonight we start Psalm 119. You know Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. There's 176 verses in Psalm 119. 174 of them mention the Word of God. You're going to be familiar with words like law and precepts and testimonies and statutes and ways and judgments. These are all synonyms for the Word of God, and yet they are also a very dynamic and unique way to look at the Word of God, different perspectives from which we will see it. Psalm 119 opens then with this stanza that recognizes the absolute blessing of having God's Word, understanding God's Word, and ultimately obeying God's Word. We're going to talk about the blessing of obedience. But to sort of get your mind rolling a little bit before we even dive back into Psalm 119, I would just ask the question for you to ponder, and that is, is obedience a blessing? 
That's the question. Is obedience a blessing? Obedience is one of those words that we tend to assign a negative connotation to. When we tell somebody to obey, they typically take that as negative, as though we're infringing upon their free will, we're infringing upon their rights, maybe we're making them do something that they don't want to do. And so we'll throw words like obedience or maybe words like repentance or words like patience or words like um, submission. We'll take those words and sort of give them a negative connotation when the Bible doesn't speak to them as negative words. But the question is, is obedience a blessing? I want you to think about that because the very first attack recorded in Scripture, the very first attack against humanity, the very first temptation brought up that very reality, that obedience is not a blessing. That was the very first temptation. In Genesis chapter 3, we read, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, if you remember the command of God, there was only one for all of humanity at that time. One single command. And it was this in Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. One command. We used to take boys to RA camp. Ian's here. Ian was notorious. His mother was always nervous when Ian would go to camp with us, wondering what kind of trouble he was going to get into. It was a reputation you had when you were little. I'm sorry, Ian, is the truth. She would ask me, was Ian good at camp? And I would tell her, Ian has never given me one ounce of trouble at camp. That's true. Because we'd take the boys and we'd say, here's the deal. This is your schedule. As long as you're where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there, and you stay inside these canyon walls at Floyd Ada, and you don't go someplace you're not supposed to go, like into some room or office or whatever, then do whatever you want. I'm not going to hound you. I'm not going to follow you. I'm not going to, as long as you're where you're supposed to be and you stay where you're supposed to be, have at it. And the boys seem to love that and do well, and we never had any trouble. God had even less strenuous, uh, less commands for Adam and Eve than that. You can have anything you want in the garden. Touch anything, eat anything, whatever you want. It's all yours. Enjoy it. Keep the garden. Cultivate the garden. You want to grow something, grow it. You want to plant something, plant it. You want to eat something, eat it. You want to climb something, climb it. It doesn't really matter. It's all yours for your enjoyment except one thing. There's one tree in the middle of the garden. Don't touch it. Don't eat from it or you'll die. And notice how Satan comes on the scene. We read it in Genesis 3, but Satan comes to Eve and said, Indeed, Has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Well, that's not what God said at all. God said you can eat from any tree in the garden, except one. It's all in the terminology. It's all in the mindset in which Satan, his objective is to get Eve to see God's command as restrictive, to see God's command as prohibitive, and God's command is meant to restrain satisfaction. There is something out there for you that God has said you can't have. That's the way Satan words it to Eve. And our world has bought that lie. Our world, if you ask them about Christianity, it's just a religion that keeps people from doing things they want to do, right? Christians can't dance. Christians can't drink. Christians can't whatever it may be, except Rebecca, she can dance. So most of us can't, right? And you get this idea, and that's the perspective, that if I get into religion, and sometimes religion can be this way, but if I get into falling, it's just a bunch of commands, God telling me, do this, after all, he's famous for ten of them, and they all start the same way, right? Thou shalt not. And it just sounds terrible to humanity. And that's the way Satan came to Eve. Boy, God, he put you in this great garden, and he won't let you touch it, right? Do you all ever have a room like that in your grandparents' house, maybe, that you'd go, and you weren't allowed in that room? She didn't want you touching anything in that room. We had a, I had a great grandmother like that. There was a room where you weren't supposed to go in, touch anything. All you want to do is go in that room, right? It's off limits. Can't touch it. Everything good must be in that room, and we can't have it. That's the way Satan came to Eve. Eve saw through it. Eve told Satan, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. No, you're wrong there, Satan. We, we can eat from any of them. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. 
So Eve survives the first attempt. She says, no, you're all wrong there. We, it, the whole thing is for our taking. It's just that one tree we can't eat from or touch it. And Satan responded to Eve and he said this, you surely will not die. What's Satan doing there? First, he tries to get Eve to think God's command is a negative thing. And secondly, he tries to get Eve to believe that there is no such thing for a consequence for disobedience. That's the next thing. Relinquish the consequence of disobedience. It's not a big deal. You're taking it too literal. We serve a God of love. Maybe somebody would say that. That won't happen. You're not going to die. Uh, I don't know who told you that. You're taking it too serious. You're taking it too literal. You're not going to get in trouble. You won't get caught. Nobody will know. That's the big deception of our age because everybody gets on a cell phone and, and it gives the illusion of privacy. It gives the illusion of confidentiality when in reality you've never been more public. Uh, they track everything. They know everything you're doing. I mean, Siri's listening to every word you say. They, they know everything that's going on, and yet people think that I can get in my bedroom with my little phone and nobody knows what's going on. It's the illusion of zero consequence. That's what our world deals with. Satan continues to Eve, and he says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what's the third thing he tells her? Not only, Eve, are God's commands meant to restrict you from fun and satisfaction, and not only are you overthinking the consequences of disobedience, but, Eve, disobedience is so fun. It is so fun. When you do what you're not supposed to do, when you do what is edgy, there's an adrenaline rush. It is good. It is fun. When you let yourself go, I mean, look at the advertisements of the world. They call Vegas Sin City. It's about to go bankrupt, and nobody will go there. Are you kidding? They flock to that place because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You can do whatever you want. You can live it up. New Orleans, right, in the Mardi Gras mentality. Just let go of your inhibitions. Just let go of, of all of your restrictions because disobedience is fun. So you listen to how Satan worked in the very beginning. Obedience is unfair and unfun. Disobedience is not as costly as you might think. And disobedience holds satisfaction beyond your wildest dreams. That's what he said. Obedience is not a blessing. That's what he would tell her. And with that, Eve was sunk. In Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. You understand Satan's argument. Obedience, he would say, is a bad thing. The only people in our world who obey God are either those who have been fooled into believing this superstition of religion, this fairy tale nonsense, or it's those who are pharisaical and hypocritical and super judgmental. You know, they just do it so that they can run their finger down at you. Or it's those who are miserable in their life, but they're afraid they're going to make God mad. And that's sort of the mentality about those who obey. Satan would tell you to cut loose and enjoy it. So when someone tells you that you should obey God, it can often hit you in the forehead like it's a bad thing. Well, I think the garden alone would teach us otherwise. Genesis 3, 7 says, after they disobeyed God, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. In a moment, innocence is gone. In a moment, intimacy is gone. In a moment, shame has arrived. And we haven't even gotten yet to the announcement of the curse and its sister death. That hadn't even shown up on the scene yet. But in a moment when sin happens, nothing paid off the way it was supposed to pay off. And for the first time, it has to hit the mind of Adam and Eve that perhaps the command of God was not to limit us, but to protect us. Maybe obedience was, in fact, a blessing. Well, I'm going to bring that supposition to you as we look at the first eight verses of Psalm 119. To get the gist of this first paragraph, you really need to look first at the very last line, verse 8, the very last line. David makes all these statements about obedience, and then almost out of the blue, the very last phrase of the first stanza, and David cries out, do not forsake me utterly. Now the fact that he throws the word utterly on there tells us to, to some extent, David already feels forsaken. If he had just said, do not forsake me, you would see him as afraid God will. But when he says, do not forsake me utterly, there seems to be some, some standpoint, some issue in which David already feels a little forsaken, and he's afraid now that God's going to go all the way and completely and totally forsake him. Most agree David wrote Psalm 119, and it's not hard to find a scenario in which this could have been true of David. You're all familiar with the Bathsheba incident, 
David sees her bathing. He decides he wants her. He goes to her. He has an affair with her. She becomes pregnant as a result of the affair. David doesn't want to be found out, so he calls her husband in from the battlefield. He says, come on in. Instead of going to be with his wife, that was David's plan. He'll come in. He'll go be with his wife. Nobody will know the worst for wear. They'll just think it's his kid, and we escape. Uh, but instead, Uriah was extremely loyal. He slept at David's porch. And David said, you're not going to go home to your wife? And he said, well, how could I? All my, all my buddies are out fighting. There's no way I'm going to go home and lay with my wife. So David sends Uriah back to the battle line with a note. He carries the note of his own execution. He doesn't even know it. And he takes the note to Joab, which is the general, and the note says, I want you to draw near when the battle gets fierce, and I want you to put Joab at the front, and then I want everybody to retreat around him. That's exactly what they do. Joab is killed, and David thinks he's off the hook. Of course, God knows, just as God knew with Adam and Eve. And when God confronts David, it brings to us that great psalm of repentance from David, Psalm 51. This is the psalm in which David is repenting before God. But listen to what he says, Psalm 51.10. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. What does David mean, do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me? What does he mean by that? Well, I want you to consider for a second David's predecessor. I want you to consider Saul. David was chosen by God to be king. Before David was chosen by God to be king, who was chosen? Saul was chosen by God to be king. Before David was anointed, Saul was anointed. Before David wore the crown, Saul wore the crown. Before David was God's man, Saul was God's man. It all begins to demise of fall on a night when he is about to fight a battle with the Philistines. He's seeing them ready to fight. But Saul knows enough to know that I want to give a sacrifice to the Lord before we fight. I want to entreat God's favor. And certainly all my men want God's favor entreated. And so Saul is waiting on Samuel because it's a very specific command. Kings are not priests and priests are not kings. Kings cannot enter the holy place. Kings cannot go in and make sacrifice. You can't do it that way. God has forbidden it. That is the title reserved only for Christ. He's the only priest king. But here you have Saul, and his people are getting antsy, and he's wanting to give a sacrifice before they go fight the Philistines, and Samuel is nowhere to be found. So Saul, in a moment of impulse, does what is expressly forbidden for him to do. Now, think about it. It seemed to make perfect sense. If there was ever a loophole, if there was ever a circumstance in which disobedience in this case is probably okay, you would think it would be when a king is going to fight on, you know, the commander of God's army, he's going to fight the pagan Gentiles, but he first wants to entreat God's favor. You would think if there was a loophole in which God would say, well, under that circumstance, I get it. We do that all the time. We justify our disobedience because we think our circumstances allow it. Well, that's what Saul does. Saul, in a moment of impulse, gives the sacrifice himself. And wouldn't you know, No sooner does he give the sacrifice than Samuel shows up. And in 1 Samuel 13, this was God's response. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul disobeyed God even with a seemingly good excuse. And God said, that's it. You can be king for a little while, but your kingly line is done. I I would have established your line forever, but not anymore. You're a one and done now. You're a flash in the pan. That's it. After you, nobody from your line is going to sit on the throne. I'm going to anoint someone else. You'd think that Saul would have learned greatly from his disobedience. He didn't. If you go a little further In the first Samuel 15, two chapters later, he's going to war against Amalek. Amalek has a king named Agag. And when God sends him to war against Agag and all the people of Amalek, there is a very specific command, and that is when you find Agag, kill him. Kill him. Kill him, kill his wife, kill anything that moves, kill his children, wipe them all out. Everybody. But look at what Saul does in first Samuel 15. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Should have given you the verse, Saul didn't kill Agag. He kept him alive. He kept some of the livestock alive. When Samuel asked him why, Saul said, well, I kept him alive so we could sacrifice him to God. Seems like a good idea. God was angry. God comes to Saul and says, I have regret that I have made him king. 
And so Samuel confronts Saul, and in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. What happens at that moment? God rejected Saul now. He told him, I want you to go and I want you to wipe out Agag and his entire line. Saul didn't. Instead, I'm going to keep some of these and I'm going to sacrifice them to God. Seems like a good idea. Seems like a justifiable disobedience. And Samuel comes up and says, that's not what God said. He said to do this. And you disobeyed him. And he actually makes the statement that rebellion is like the sin of divination. That insubordination is like idolatry. You would be better off to bow down again to the golden calf. That's to disobey when God gives you a command. And so God makes a decision. Saul, it's over for you. I'm done with you. Your line was already removed, and now I'm done with you. If you follow the story along, 1 Samuel 16, 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. A little further, 1 Samuel 18. Now Saul was afraid of David, for the Lord was with him, but he had departed from Saul. So Saul, on two accounts, disobeys God in what might seem like a justifiable disobedience. Both of them had to do with making a sacrifice to God. One time he offered it when he wasn't supposed to, and another time he offered what he wasn't supposed to offer. But that was his sin. The great sin of Saul is to sacrifice to God in the wrong way. That's all he did. And God rejected his line, and then God rejected him. And the Spirit of God leaves Saul, and an evil spirit comes to terrorize him, and God departs from Saul and goes to be with David. So now imagine David. When it wasn't about giving the wrong sacrifice or in the wrong way, David has actually committed adultery and had a man killed. And you understand now in Psalm 51 when David says, Please do not forsake me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You understand Psalm 119 when he says, Do not forsake me utterly. You understand why he would be concerned. One moment, he's looking for a good time with Bathsheba. She was bathing. It looked fun. At one point, eliminating her husband seemed like a good idea. You won't get caught. No one will know. I can only imagine what Satan must have whispered in David's ear as he stood on his balcony and watched Bathsheba. Has God told you that you can't be with women? That's just not fair, is it? God won't let you be with a woman. Well, that's not what God told David. But can you hear Satan? Or perhaps he said, go ahead, you're the king. Nothing will happen to you. Nobody will know. You're the king. Of all people, you should be able to have any woman you want. Or maybe he said, look, you've never been with a woman like Bathsheba. You don't even know what you're missing. Obedience is holding you back, David. Obedience is a killjoy. You're overthinking consequences. Just go do it. It'll be fun. But here's David on the other side of disobedience. And now he has fear. Do not forsake me utterly. That's not all. Look at verses 5 and 6, just to remind you of the psalm. David now has a prayer to God. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. Now you understand again why David is afraid he's going to be forsaken by God. Because when David opens the law of God and begins to read it, what does he get? Shame. You ever been there? When you open the Bible, but it doesn't seem to have much good to say about you. All there is is condemnation. All there is is conviction. I've shared with you before from my high school years and my thought process of my carnal heart, I couldn't open the Bible without reading something about sexual immorality. Everything was about lust. Every It was on every page. It was in every verse. It's like God didn't write about anything else. Because when you have sin in your life, that's what he does. And this is what David says. Man, I wish I was obedient so that I wouldn't have shame when I looked at your commandments. Man, I wish I was obedient so I could enjoy going to church and listening to sermons. Man, I wish I was obedient so church would be fun and fulfilling and worship would be good. But instead, all I get is shame. I sit here and feel the weight of my sin. I sit here and feel condemnation. I sit here and feel guilt. I hate it. I wish I could be obedient so that that didn't happen. David's miserable. He's miserable. He's ashamed and convicted. He's at enmity with God, and he's afraid that God's going to utterly forsake him. And if that's not bad enough, David looks around the room, 
And he sees people who, at least in his estimation, didn't sin, that do it right. And you know what he looks around the room and sees? Happy people. People that actually seem to enjoy being in church. People that seem to get up early and read their Bibles and actually crave it. They want to do it. They want to get up and read their Bible. They they like sermons. I've heard of people that put them on in their cars when they drive down the road. They like listening to preaching. Who wants to go to church on Sunday night and Wednesday night, right? They just keep going. This doesn't seem right. But David looks around at these people, and they seem happy. Look at it in verses 1 to 3. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do know unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. David says, man, those are happy people. They walk in the law of the Lord. They observe his testimonies. They seek him with all their heart. They do know unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. And David says, they are blessed. They are happy. They don't seem to have any shame when they study the Scriptures. They don't seem to have any fear of God that God's going to forsake them. That's true. They didn't get the night with Bathsheba. But they didn't get the remorse that came with it either. David got to eat the fruit, but they got to stay in the garden. Doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem fair almost. And here's David in the midst of his guilt looking at those who've been obedient, and he's filled with envy. It's no wonder we read Psalm 1, which says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." And so you begin to understand David's deepest desire. He doesn't want Bathsheba anymore, figuratively in that sense. He doesn't want that forbidden fruit. In verse 5 he says, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I will not be ashamed when I look upon your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. Oh, that's what I want. I want to live obediently so that I have a life of gratitude, so that I have a life of joy. I don't want any more shame. I want to enjoy gazing upon your statutes. Do you see David there in those first eight verses? Maybe you can identify with him. Sin does that to a person. It offers endless satisfaction. It offers no consequences, and it never delivers. Never. It offers you one thing and gives you something else. Is the fruit initially good? Yeah. I mean, Solomon would say one day that stolen bread is sweet to the taste, but afterwards it makes the stomach bitter. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't a moment in which David enjoyed what he did with Bathsheba. I'm sure he did. But the after effect and the condemnation before God and the guilt and the shame made it all not worth it. Obedience isn't a restriction meant to keep you from the good life. It is a restraint meant to protect you from judgment. Well, David learned that. He's got that. But that's not all he learned. There's a statement in the middle And this is the statement I want to focus on a little bit more tonight. Verse 4. There's a conviction David develops. There is a theological statement, a foundational truth. And this is the truth that comes out of David's experience. This sin that led him to dread the judgment of God. This sin that caused him to fear being cut off utterly by God. This envy that he saw with those who were obedient and the blessing that was on their lives, the happiness they enjoyed for obeying God. All of that cumulatively together brought David to a foundational theological truth. And it's verse 4, in which David says this, You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. When we studied this verse last time, I think it came under the heading, God is serious. That's a good way to put it. When God commands obedience, he's not joking. It's not optional. It's not up for your approval as though God takes his commands, delivers it to us, and says, what do you think? That reasonable? We don't barter with God. When God gives a command, he means it. It's a matter of divine authority, and there's no room for argument. 
as we've been talking about, especially the last two Sunday mornings, there are commands in the Bible that I don't always understand and that don't always initially hit me well. But we're under no option that we can obey or disobey. We, we can't go to God and say, I'm sorry, I don't want to obey this one. David learned that. There's no amount of reason that justifies disobedience, and there's no excuse that God accepts. Ask Saul. Samuel told him, don't give the sacrifice. Listen to Saul in 1 Samuel 13. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, get this. Because I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the appointed days, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, therefore I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord, so I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Was that excuse acceptable to God? Nope. Tell him his line is finished. What about when he didn't kill Agag? 1 Samuel 15, Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice unto the Lord your God at Gilgal. We didn't spare it, we're going to give it to God. Was that excuse acceptable to God? No. I'm done with you as king. Adam said in Genesis 3, The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. That one work? Nope. How about Eve in Genesis 3.13? The Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. That make everything okay? No. They both were covered in shame. They had to leave the garden. Obedience is not optional. But the question I want to ask you is why? Why is it not okay to disobey God's word? Why is disobedience not optional? And the simple and direct answer of David here is because it is God's word. God's word. <clears throat> Look at what he says. You have ordained your precepts. It's another way of saying because God said so. It's one thing to disagree with another person. We have different logic, different experiences. We come at problems from different directions and angles. And you may disagree with a human. But to disagree, disagree with God is folly every time. God himself ordained his word. And no man has the right to disobey it. Ever. The Hebrew word for ordained. When he says you have ordained your precepts. The Hebrew word is savah. Show you another place that's used. Sava, Genesis 2.16. The Lord God commanded Sava, the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Same word. It didn't matter how good the tree looked. It didn't matter if Satan told you to go ahead. It didn't matter if your wife offered you a bite. You couldn't eat from that tree. Why? Because God said you can't eat from that tree. There didn't have to be an excuse, have to be a reason. God didn't have to explain the chemical makeup of the fruit on that tree and what it does to your gallbladder. God didn't have to talk about the obesity and heart disease and diabetes. God didn't have to talk about sustainability. If you eat from that tree, then who else is going to eat from it? God didn't have to explain himself at all. I just said don't eat from that tree. That's all you need to know. Don't eat from the tree. God said... But that's not all that David says here. David says, you have ordained your precepts. A lot of different synonyms are going to be used for God's word throughout Psalm 119. In fact, you, you see them all the way throughout. In verse 1, he calls it the law of the Lord. In verse 2, his testimonies. In verse 3, his ways. Verse 4, his precepts. Verse 5, his statutes. Verse 6, his commandments. He uses different words all throughout. And so it is not insignificant when we see a certain word used. What are these precepts? What's the word David uses here? The word for precepts in the Hebrew is pikudim. And it means command, if you just want to look up that word. But it comes from a root word. The root word is pakad, pakad in the Hebrew. And it can mean to trust, or to entrust, or to deposit. You even see it used. Psalm 31.6, I hate those who regard vain idols, but I pakad, trust in the Lord. 
Isaiah 10, 28. He's come against Aath. He has passed through Migron. At Michmash, he pakad, deposited his baggage. So he takes that root word and uses a form of it that speaks of a command. Only we realize now, when we see the word precepts, we're not just talking about a command in which God just says, do this, take it, live with it, deal with it. Instead, the word seems to mean it is a truth which God has entrusted to you. It is a command that is beneficial, that he has given to you as one would give a treasure, that he has entrusted to you, that you will do well with it, that you will do right with it. Consider this view from Paul in 1 Timothy 6. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. When Paul spoke of the gospel or the commands of God, he didn't talk about this heavy burden. He spoke of it in verbiage as a treasure, as a gift, as that which God had entrusted to Timothy to protect and to guard, even to disseminate. Don't let it get watered down. Don't let it get excused. Don't let it get passed over. Guard it, Timothy. Protect it, Timothy. This is from God. It's entrusted to you. Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. That's the word David uses here. God has entrusted you with this command. God has made these precepts and he has given them to you. Sometimes we have this view of God's commands as though they are restrictive by nature and it's something that God is using to withhold good from us. Think about Adam for a second. Was God withholding from Adam in the garden? Think about his life there. Adam has everything. Everything. He gets to name all the animals. He can have from any tree. He can do anything he wants. He's got a flawless wife. Everything is perfect. And Adam is in charge. And God entrusted Adam. It's that same word, precepts, commandments. God entrusted Adam with the order and the care and the management of the garden. And he entrusted him with the command, don't let anything eat or touch this tree. I'm giving that to you, Adam. You're the protector. You're the cultivator. You're the manager of the garden. Adam Here's the command. I'm giving it to you. Treasure it. Guard it. Protect it. Disseminate it. Let everybody know. There is a great life for you here in the garden. Just Adam. Keep this command. God wasn't hurting Adam. He was helping him. Remember David. Remember when David commits this sin with Bathsheba and he thinks he gets away with it. Nathan the prophet comes to him with that famous you are the man speech. You remember that? He tells him the story about the poor man that has a little lamb and then the rich man that has that whole flock and when the visitors come by the the rich man doesn't want to kill one of his own sheep to feed the visitors so he goes and he seizes the poor man's lamb which he loved and he kills that lamb and he takes it and feeds it to his guest and David says that man shall not live Nathan said you are that man and notice what Nathan goes on to say in 2 Samuel 12 Nathan then said to David you are the man Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, have taken his wife to be your own, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now you read that, and the question is, was God trying to cheat David? I've given you everything, David. I gave you the kingdom. I gave you his wives. If that had been too little, I'd have given you more. I I wasn't trying to withhold from you. Why would you despise the command of God? Why would you not obey what I told you to do? David gets it now, doesn't he? David makes the statement in verse 4, You have ordained your precepts. Those came from you. They were entrusted to us. You had every intention that we would obey them. They were not to hinder us. They were a blessing to us. You gave them to us. They are from you. They are for us. And David makes this statement. You ordained them that we should keep them diligently. That word diligently can mean greatly or exceedingly to a great degree. Or you can even zoom it in and say carefully, meticulously, of priority. God's commands are certainly not optional, but understand this. They are also not secondary. God's commands are to get preeminence. 
God's commands are to have priority. There should have been nothing valued more by Adam in the garden than the command of God, than the law of God. If there was ever a law and ever a time in human history when a law should have been put on a doorstop or on your forehead, that should have been it. Don't touch that tree. But it wasn't priority. It didn't have preeminence. Nothing should have mattered more. But when God's word took second place to the reasonings of Eve, everything fell apart. I hope you understand that God's word is meant to be kept and kept diligently. That we read it and we meditate on it and we search it and we seek God and we strive for it and work for it and focus on it and we don't quit. David now understands the ramifications of failing to do that. In a moment of insolent rebellion, in a moment of the flesh, David slipped. And instead of the blessing of obedience, David has the curse of sin, the shame, the rejection. And he looks at those who are obedient and says, those are the blessed ones. Man, I wish I was obedient. Now that's true. Everything about that is true. The whole objective and goal of our life is to obey God. And yet you and I know we got a massive problem there, don't we? Look at those first three verses again. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. Who are they? Who are those people? If you're one of those people, raise your hand. I mean, we would like to, we would like to be able to see what a truly obedient life looks like. We're just looking for someone whose way is blameless, someone who walks in the law of the Lord, someone who observes his testimonies, who seeks him with all their heart, who does no unrighteousness, and who walks in his ways. That's, where are you? Where are you? We got a problem, don't we? We find out when we read the first eight verses of Psalm 119, we want to look at David and go, well, David, if you'd have just done it like we told you to do it, you'd be happy like I'm happy. And then we find out something. We're not the people in verses 1 through 3. We're David. I wish I was obedient. I wish I kept the law of God. This is more Romans 7 to us than it is some blessing or celebration. I wanted to do the good I tried to do. I tried to do it, but I didn't. I failed the very evil. I didn't want to do that. I did. Ah, wretched man that I am. Please don't forsake me utterly. What a miserable person I am. What conviction is upon my life. What shame there is. What separation. God would be justified to forsake me utterly. I wish I could read your word without conviction. I wish I could read your word without remorse. I wish I could say I have obeyed you blamelessly. I wish I could enjoy the blessing of obedience. I wish I had that. I get it, God. Your precepts are ordained by you, and they are meant to be kept diligently. I just wish that was me. The problem is it's not me. We all have those David moments. Every one of us. We live more in that moment than we do in the first three verses, I promise you. We're far more at the end of this psalm than we are at the beginning. We know what it's like to feel the shame of our sin. We know what it's like to feel the condemnation of our sin. We know what it is to dread being utterly forsaken by God because that's what we deserve. But the Bible presents a solution. In Hebrews 10, we read, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired. Huh. Seems like that's something about what Samuel said to Saul. Isn't it? But a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. That's exactly what Samuel told Saul. He doesn't want a sacrifice. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Isn't that what Samuel said? God doesn't want sacrifices. What's he want? Obedience. He wants obedience. He wants you to do what he said. Well, Jesus here said, I didn't come to give sacrifice. I came to do your will. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you've not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are all offered according to the all, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now follow that passage because it's a great one. You have Christ who understands the entire purpose of his incarnation. We celebrate Christmas. We love the little baby in the manger. 
You understand why that baby is a little baby? You understand why he comes into the earth in human form? Why he doesn't just come in an angelic-like emanation? He doesn't just come as a great mighty prophet that hovers over everybody and, and, and you know declares the law of God. He comes as a human. He comes as a baby. The Bible says that the eighth day he was circumcised. Do you know why? He was coming under the law. That's what he's doing. He takes that entire commandment and says, give me a shot. With years and years and years of failure, when everybody says you can't do it, God's law is too tough, God's law is too strenuous, here's a man named David, a man after God's own heart, and even David is crying out, please do not forsake me utterly. I wish I kept your law, but I don't. And years and years and decades and decades and centuries of people who one by one continually fail, Christ shows up and says, let me try. Put the yoke on my neck, he says. You remember later in the book of Acts, whenever they're all arguing about whether or not Gentiles have to be circumcised. And Paul comes back and gives the testimony. And Peter makes this statement. Why do you want to throw a yoke on the neck of the Gentiles that neither we or our fathers have ever been able to bear? Why do you want to put that yoke on their neck? None of us ever kept it. Well, Jesus shows up and says, put the yoke on my neck. Now, do you understand why he says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest, take my yoke upon you? Do you understand what that yoke is? That yoke is the burden of righteousness. Only he's going to do the pulling. I'll do it. You just latch yourself to me. That's all he's saying. I'll do it. You latch yourself to me. He says, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come under the law. I'm going to come in a human body, and I'm going to put myself under the restrictions of God's law. Give me every thou shalt not. Give me every do this. And not just the outward letter of the law, but give me the heart of the law, the sense of the law. That's what Jesus preaches. And it's not about don't commit murder. It's don't even hate your brother. It's not about don't commit adultery. It's don't even lust. I mean, David was an adulterer before he ever said a word to Bathsheba because of what he did when he looked at her from his rooftop. And Jesus says, throw that on me. I'll take every ounce of it. And he walks and knocks it completely out of the park. Unbelievable. He does what no human's ever been able to do. Perfectly, flawlessly. He is the only one that the first three verses of Psalm 119 could possibly apply to. He is the only blessed one whose way is blameless. He's the only one who walks in the law of the Lord. He's the only blessed one who observes his testimonies. He's the only one that seeks God with all his heart. He's the only one that does no unrighteousness. He's the only one that walks in the ways of God. That's the only possible one that that could possibly be. That's Jesus. And all we would be able to do at this point is just sit back in church and look at Jesus and say, I wish I was like Jesus, right? That's called moral religion, where Jesus is held up as the moral example, be like Jesus. Well, that would be great. I wish I could have. I wish I did. Just be like Jesus. I wish I was like Jesus. I wish you were like Jesus, too. It would be a lot easier to preach to you if you were like Jesus. Wouldn't that be great? That doesn't do us any good. All we do is we sit like David, and we sit there in our shame, in our sin, looking at those who are righteous, going, man, I wish that was me. doesn't help. I still live in fear of being utterly forsaken. Were it not for the last part of what Hebrews 10 says, that by this will we have been sanctified. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus comes and lives a perfect life, and we get sanctified? How does that work? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all what he did in that body he then took it to god and offered that righteous life to god and said oh this is for rory you don't want rory's life you don't want what rory has to offer it's foul it's rotten you don't want it you don't want what Oli has to offer or rebecca has to offer you don't want what any of them have to offer trust me don't take it i'm giving this this is on their behalf I'm giving what you want. You don't want sacrifices and goats and calves and the blood of bulls. That's never been what you desired. You wanted obedience. That's what you wanted, obedience. And I've come to give you the obedience that you have required, and I've come to give it to you on their behalf. That's the gospel. I came to do your will. And the writer of Hebrews says, we have been sanctified through that offering. He secures for us the blessing that David greatly desires. He secures for us the security that David wanted so badly. He secures for us the peace which David is missing. What a great song to sing, Jesus paid it all. That's true. He did it all. We did nothing. Now, I want to keep in theme. I certainly want you to understand the gospel aspect of this. But I also don't want you to take this to some level in which Scripture does not. Since Christ has done it all for us, does that mean that now we just float back and go, well... No sense me obeying. No sense me caring. Jesus did it. Jesus paid it all. I don't have to do it. Is that how we're supposed to look at it? Paul answered that question. Listen to this in Romans 6. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? I mean, we'll just keep charging it to Jesus. I've got his credit card, right? I'll just keep doing what I want. I'll just charge it to Jesus. Is that what we're going to do? Paul said, may it never be. In the Greek, that's the strongest negative Paul has. It's no, 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 no. And Paul says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? When you identified with Jesus, you died with him. Therefore, we've been buried with him, and you were buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Understand me here, no one... No one who values righteousness can stay away from Jesus. He's the only place to get it. But once you come to Jesus, no one who comes to Jesus quits valuing righteousness after they find him. In fact, you probably value it more so. It would be the utter disrespect to the sacrifice of Christ to say, well, Jesus is righteous, so now I don't have to be. I can do whatever I want. Paul says, no way. It's a simple point to be made tonight. Obedience. Obedience is not the means by which you and I are blessed of God. That ship sailed a long time ago. We blew it. Christ is the only means by which we are acceptable to God. Only he was obedient. But listen to me. Obedience will forever remain the Christian ambition. Obedience will forever remain the Christian desire. There is no such thing as a Christian with a low view of obedience. That is an oxymoron. That does not happen. We have so valued it and so hungered and so thirsted for righteousness... That in our quest, it did not lead us to the law, it led us to Christ. Because he's the only one that had it. But it's not as though when, when Christ finds us and saves us and redeems us that we quit wanting righteousness all of a sudden. We want it even more now. We strive for it. So in a sense, these eight verses of Psalm 119 remain our desire. They remain what we want. We sing that song, Knowing You, Jesus. There is no greater thing. I want to know you in your suffering. I want to know you in your righteousness. I want to be like you. I want to be conformed to you. I want to know you. That's the Christian call. Yes, we have been redeemed through Christ. Yes, we are declared righteous through Christ. But we still sit here with David with the same desire. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. God, I want to be obedient. I want to please you. I want to walk in a manner that glorifies you. Not that we're earning our salvation, Christ did that. But that remains the Christian ambition, the Christian duty, the Christian desire. Obedience is not a negative. It is one of the greatest blessings. It is one of the greatest joys. It is one of the greatest things that we give and get to do from God and for God. They're not burdensome. They are a treasure meant to protect us from our own logic, our own desires, and the consequences of sin. Obedience is important. It's our desire, then, that we all become more obedient as we trust Christ for the justification he gives. Psalm 119, 1 to 3, that is Christ. But it also is a great example of the Christian ambition. You want to know what we strive for in life? Well, that's it. To be conformed into the image of Jesus. That's what we strive for. I want to be like him. We say with David, how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do know in righteousness, they walk in his ways. That's Christ, and that's our ambition as well, to be like him, to know him in that way. That's Psalm 119, thinking about obedience, where it rests in the Christian life. Father, we come to you because you are a God, and we praise you because you're worthy. We thank you for your law. We don't hate it. We love it. We don't see your commands as negative. We see them as giving of life. We see them as joyful, as protecting us from the folly of our own heart. And God, we do strive for obedience. We do hunger and thirst for righteousness. It is our goal. It is our hope. And yet at the same time, in our failure, we are so thankful for Jesus who did what we could not, who came and fulfilled your law and who gave it to you on our behalf. For this one who satisfied your righteous commands, this one who then sanctifies us through what he has done, we thank you for that. But God, we still strive to obey. We still strive to do what is pleasing. We still strive to lift our bodies to you, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to you as a spiritual service of worship. No longer as an offering for our sin because it's not enough, but we do give it to you as worship. We give you our obedience. 
we come to obey you and to follow you and trust you. All the while paying tribute to Christ who is our example. All the while paying tribute to Christ who is our leader and our head. We pray, God, that you help us to walk in a manner worthy of him, to please him, to be conformed into his image. But God, ultimately, we thank you for him, that he has saved us and redeemed us and made us yours. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.